Hi all, Dr. Clark here. And for forest management today, we're going to start with an introduction to basically what is a forest or what is forestry. I think a lot of people, when they hear the term forest, they imagine, um, you know, maybe they're imagining something like this or forestry, you're imagining something like this where you might have some machinery or you might have bloggers or something like that that are coming in and cutting trees and, and managing a forest that way. Um, other people might, when they hear forestry, they might think of research, scientific research. Okay? Um, especially if you're near a college, you might see this, or near a forest service station or something like that, and you have a home nearby, um, travel much in, in uh forest land you might see setups like this where you know researchers are trying to figure out um you know what kind of refractory light is used in photosynthesis of the different plants how much light is getting through the canopy how much light is needed for plant growth rates um climate change so what's happening to soil temperatures decomposition rates there's all kinds of things. We'll get to some of the science that goes into forestry, um, into the forestry management and, and you know, advises the forestry industry. Okay, maybe you think of forest fires, maybe you have friends or, or relatives or people that you might know, um, or maybe you've seen, maybe you live in a region that has a lot of fire um, and you think of forest fires. Um, and in today's world, um, the last 10, 15 years, um, it's definitely been a big issue. Uh, billions of dollars are spent on fighting forest fires or um, trying to rebuild after a forest fire comes through every year. It's very expensive um, to fight fires, but it's also very expensive to clean up after them or, um, you know, take care of the landscape afterwards. And we'll come back to this um, in a lot more lectures on firefighting and, and, and its role in forest management. Some of you might think of law enforcement. Um, maybe you're into riding you know dirt bikes or suvs or maybe horseback and on forest land land so the forest service lands and maybe you've talked to some of the law law enforcement um so maybe that comes to mind maybe especially if you had a recent um, conversation with them that might come to mind and for some of you it might just be a forest. It might just be trees. Now, um, whether or not these are managed, um, it's a different story. We'll talk about a managed forest versus a non-managed forest. Okay? So not all forests that we'll talk about in this class fall under kind of the forest service, but it's still a way to manage. So just because you're doing nothing to the landscape doesn't mean that you're not managing the landscape. In actuality, you are managing the landscape. You're managing as if nature is what's managing it, and you're managing for the basic removal of anything that is not related to nature. And I bring this up because a lot of people think, well, wilderness areas, for, for example, People often say to me, well, wilderness areas, they're not managed, but they actually are managed. Um, yes, you can enter wilderness areas and on certain trails and, and certain regions you can get on them. And, and, and in fact, if you have the capability, you could walk the entire, for, uh, entire wilderness area um, or horseback the entire wilderness area. That's your right. Um, as being part of the public. However, it is managed in the sense that you can't have motors on there. You can't have electrical devices like scooters and, 
dirt bikes and uh, other things. Um, you just, you can't have those. Um, no, no motorized vehicles can go in the wilderness areas. Okay. At least the majority of wilderness areas. Now I know that there are some regions of wilderness areas that have different rules and regulations. Um, other than the ones that are set aside for majority of wilderness areas. That's still management. That's manage, managing the disturbance that goes into that area. Okay. That being said, often wilderness areas are not, um, you, if there's a fire, you're not putting it out. Um, if there's a big beetle kill or fungus kill or um, a massive drought that kills a bunch of trees, you're not allowing people to go in there and cut those trees down um, and remove them. So there is still management. It's just from a point of you're managing what gets into that region, into that forest or into that wilderness. Okay. We'll come back and we'll talk more about wilderness. We'll talk about kind of the history and, and all the Leopold's ro role in wilderness um, since he's the individual that kind of got the ball rolling and kind of set up the very first wilderness area. Um, and we'll kind of talk about that. All right. So first, we should define what a forest is. And we can use just the general definition that's given in the majority of books. And that's an ecosystem where trees are the most dominant living organism. Well, there are a lot of ecosystems where trees are the most dominant living organism, but I think we'll probably, most people would probably agree, you wouldn't consider it a forest. Okay? And I'll show you a couple in a second. Now, I like to, if I define something, I like to then define the other words that maybe you don't know, like an ecosystem. So what is an ecosystem? That's the interaction of populations of plants, animals, microorganisms, so fungi, bacteria, things like that, um, and their physical environment. So often what I kind of, when I talk about an ecosystem or the way I think about an ecosystem, I think about, okay, it's a generalized region uh, and you can pick the area. Uh, um, some ecosystems are defined by boundaries. Uh, that could be, you know, an island that's defined defined by boundaries of the land. Um, but some ecosystems are also defined by like how much water they get, things like that. But it's a given region. Okay? And I like to think of it as all abiotic pieces to that region. So in science, when we say a before a term, it often means non, okay? So if I say abiotic, it means non-living. So when I'm talking about non-living material, I'm talking about what's the soil type? What's the soil depth? What's the horizons? Okay, we'll get into this a little bit further on. So what's the nutrients, um, those kind of things. What's the temperature in the region? What's the temperature throughout the year? What's the daily maximum, daily minimum? Okay, what kind of temperature swings can you expect in the given region? Wind speeds, precipitation, okay? um, all these factors, these abiotic factors, play a role in determining the biotic factors or the living factors. Okay? So, given certain temperatures, certain amount of water. Um, you know, certain winds, et cetera, that can often dictate and often does dictate what, what can live there. It might be that it dictates what plants can live there. And then the plants, when they occupy the landscape, that then dictates what animals can live there. The animals that might pollinate those plants or feed on those plants or um, use those plants as habitat, et cetera. That's kind of how the ecosystem works. And, you know, I'll share quite a few quotes with you as we progress. Mainly, most of the quotes are coming from Aldo Leopold um, because 
you're reading Sand County Almanac, so you'll read these quotes. And I like to just kind of reiterate um, what that quote or what that passage means to me. Now, you might have a different interpretation of it, and that's fine. That's that's why I have you read it. It's very poetic. And for some people, you know, when I was younger and I first read it, um, you know, I might have saw one meaning in a certain passage and then I read it again later in life and, and it kind of has a different meaning. So um, I'll, I'll often share things with you. And, and one of the key components, one of the key quotes that that all the Leopold has is, you know, the danger of thinking of land as a commodity. Land as, you know, just there for resources. Okay? Taking of the tree, taking of the minerals, taking of the wildlife, whatever it might be. But you're thinking of it as, you know, with blinders on. Basically, you're thinking, okay, I'm here at a forest and I'm going to cut the trees down. Okay. Um, that's one way to kind of look at a system. And, you know, all the Leopold points out, that's the wrong way to look at a system. When you look at a system that way, you don't see the 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 web of connection that you have by taking that one tree out. What kind of effect is it going to have on the animals that might utilize that tree? Okay. Well, clearly that that would be a neg negative effect. But then what kind of effect is it going to have on small plants that might have been shaded out by that tree? Well, now it's a positive effect. The tree's gone, so they can get more sunlight, they can do more photosynthesis, they can grow bigger. So when you think of a area, region, etc., as an ecosystem or as a community that is connected, then you can get a better idea of what's the effect of clear cutting? What's the effect of a fire coming through? What's the effect of, you know, allowing someone to frack in that region or allowing someone to come and take oil from that region and allowing SUVs in that region, motorbikes in that region, horseback in that region. There's a lot of things that um, a good forest management plan needs to spell out. Okay, well, how much of these activities are, are we going to allow and what's the potential cost to the environment. Okay, so when we talk about forest, we're talking about an ecosystem that's dominated by trees. We talk about ecosystem, we're talking about the interaction between abiotic and biotic conditions. Okay? When we talk about forestry, it's a little bit different. Now it's not just about the science. Okay, so if, if it was just about the science, then it would be a piece of cake. Managers all over the United States and the world for that matter, would just love forest management if it was all about the science, okay? Where you just plug the numbers in, you see what your results are, and that's your decision. It's not, it's not the case, okay? And it's not the case when we talk about wildlife management in the United States. It's not the case when we talk about rangeland management in the United States. And for that matter, it's not the case even when we talk about things that are not based on conservation, but preservation like the National Park Service. There is science, okay? so the biology of the system, and hopefully um, a good manager is using that first. Okay? is using the biology first to make their decisions, to make their plan or whatever it might be that they're doing. So that comes first. But then you have to think about what's the politics behind it. Okay. So if you have a region where you know, it really needs to be cleaned out, cleared out, the trees are, are too dense, we haven't had a fire in that region in a long time, so you want to do prescribed burns and prescribed cutting so you can clean the floor out and cut some trees down and open it up. Um, 
what's the politics behind it? Okay. Quite literally, in some regions, um, it'll never happen. You could never get a prescribed burn permit because, you know, the winds are always going to be in the direction of a town, a city, et cetera, and they'll never allow for it to happen. Okay? Or there might be community trails in that region that are so heavily used that you just can't get in there and do it um, because the, the politics behind doing something like that. And that really falls into social sciences too. It would work great if you know, society had all had a forest management course. Um, so they understand that, hey, in some cases, it's really needed. Um, and, you know, managers can tell people this, look, we really need to get in there and we need to do some pre prescribed burns. Otherwise, our forest fire could be, if a forest fire broke out, it could be a disaster for the region. Everyone would be at loss. Um, there's also a business point of views. Okay? Um, let's say you really want to do that prescribed burn, but let's say you got logging companies knocking at the door of the Forest Service and saying, hey, we don't want you to prescribe burn. We don't want you to burn, you know, that region until we get in there and we take the trees that we want. All right? And so you might, you know, from a business point of view, say, okay, well, you know, if you take and do single cuts in the region. And most forest companies will say, you know, we're not doing a single cut, it's too difficult. It's too difficult to get equipment in there. So we wanna cut, you know, pieces of the landscape, pods of the landscape, and then move to the next, another section. Not clear cutting, clear cutting isn't done in the United States very often anymore. Um, in the 80s and 90s, uh, early 90s, man, everything was clear cut. I mean, that's just what you did. You just you just cut everything, and then in some regions, you just replant it all. Private property, that's still done quite a bit, but public property, that's it's hard to find. So instead, what they do is they cut little pods or little chunks of the landscape because the equipment can get in there, clean it up, cut it, replant it, um, but you're not cutting an entire hillside. Sometimes they do, but it's it's still rare okay and then management so when we talk about management how are you managing business social science political science managing the biology um, of a given region okay and for a for forest manager it's often well what hat am i going to wear today who am i talking to am i talking as a scientist or am i talking as a businessman to get you know the, the most uh, profit that we can off this landscape so then we can pay for roads to be put in or we can pay for fire suppression in certain regions or, you know, whatever it might be. Right? So forestry is a lot more than just, hey, here's the science. Here's what it's about. Um, and that's it. Okay? And it's it's kind of unfortunate. All right, so most of you might look at this and say, mm, okay, an apple orchard. And I'd say probably the majority of you would look at it and not say, hmm, that's a forest. Well, in fact, based on the definition of a forest, an apple orchard, apple orchard is indeed a forest. Orchards are indeed forests. Okay? Now, there's situations where you manage forests in certain ways. Of course, this is not managed for the harvest of um, cellulose material or woody material. And this is harvest for fructose or glucose material, fruit, fruiting bodies. But nonetheless, it's still harvested, it's still managed. And majority of these are on private landscapes. So the Forest Service has no, you know, really no grounds to make comments about this, except for when things like, you know, a drain, drainage ditch or something like that from this habitat pours into a drainage ditch 
from a Forest Service land, then they can make comments about what's being used on this land. And we'll talk more about water and water runoff and the importance of that. But realize just definition, okay, when we say that trees are the dominant species on the landscape, indeed, you know, that's the dominant species on the landscape. It has the most biomass. Now you could say, you could argue, well, there's a lot of grass in here, but um, there's a lot of species of grass there also. But also, you know, it's fairly obvious that the trees is the most dominant based on biomass. Okay. And to tell you the truth, there's really no difference in management between tree rows of apples or peaches or whatever it might be, almonds, okay, and tree rows of, you know, Douglas fir or, you know, some other tree that has been planted in a distinct row after a clear cut event um, or a cutting event. And, you know, the process is the same. A lot of the issues, a lot of the problems are the same, but then a lot of the, sol a lot of the solutions to other problems are the same. For example, if you plant in straight rows like this, okay, there's a lot of things that, you know, are benefit. Most of the time you can use machines okay, to plant in a straight row. You can use a machine or, you know, if you're planting in a straight row and you're using man hours, it's easier than randomly placing it all over the landscape. You can also judge the distance. Maybe you know the distance that the trees need to be apart from each other to have the fastest growth rate. And if you're just randomly sticking them on the landscape, you might stick two trees together that are too close to each other. They might compete and one will win, the other one dies, and you just lost one of your trees. Okay. There's a lot of other things that occur. So if you're going to spray herbicides or insecticides on a region okay, to keep down bugs or, or weeds and competition, then straight rows is much easier to apply um, a uniform amount across that. Now, so, so again, there are benefits. Now, there are a lot of costs, too. Trees don't grow in straight rows. Okay? So, I mean, they don't naturally grow equally spaced straight rows. So you can have problems. Now, maybe those problems aren't based necessarily on plants. Maybe they're animal-based problems. Okay? So maybe the fact that you could have a squirrel right here and you could have a predator over here and that predator could see that squirrel from much further away, a straight line. Okay. And so when we set up rows like this, we give distinct advantages to predators okay, in a predator prey situation. And you might say, well, who cares? You know, the squirrels are robbing from the trees. Anyways, they're eating the reproduction of that tree. Yes, that's true. Um, in many cases, squirrels, chipmunks, things like that, they're eating the reproduction of those trees. But do you really want these trees to start reproducing? If they start reproducing and you get some of them to reproduce and you get a tree that lines in the middle of the row and you know starts to grow, then what are you going to do to get rid of that? Okay. Now, Management as or cultivation has came up with some solutions to that you just make every single tree sterile, right? and and you don't uh, you don't allow them to produce fruiting bodies or allow them to produce offspring, right? and that's one way to get that. But then you kind of get a sterile environment. If there's nothing for chipmunks or or squirrels or anything to come in here and, here and eat. Why would they be in here? And you might say, well, that's good. We want to keep them out. Okay. Well, the problem with that is if you don't have natural organisms coming in, consuming material, you know, maybe eating weed seeds and things down these rows and defecating all over the place, 
you don't get a lot of nutrient flow. So now instead what you got to do is you got to drop nutrients on top. So you had to drop insecticides to kill off all the insects that are going to eat your thing, eat your crop. Okay. Now you got to drop herbicides to kill off all the weeds that are growing on the rows. Competition. Now you got to drop nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers so the trees can grow because you have no native material and you basically made a farm. Okay. Now, there are lots of regions that's exactly what they want. They're farming trees, not managing a forest necessarily. They're managing a farm of trees. Okay. And we'll look at that as we progress. There's, there's a difference, but not much of a difference between an apple orchard and a tree farm. Okay, they're both kind of in the same realm. Right? They're different than this back landscape that you see here, because you can see back there, you have different varieties of trees. These are different species of trees. Okay? So your diversity is higher, and it's not all uniform. Okay? Um, and we'll come back and we'll, we'll look at this these kind of examples in the future. All right, another thing that students come in often when we start with you know talking about forest management you have this ideology mainly um because most students that i teach are from the western or midwestern part of the united states uh, most students um, are not from the eastern region and most of the students are definitely not from the southeastern region so i think a lot of students have um kind of it's eye-opening to them when they soon find out that Washington and Oregon and Northern California, yes, they harvest trees there. They do. Okay? Montana, they do harvest some trees there. Idaho, a little bit of trees. But this is a drop in the bucket compared to what the southeastern part of the United States takes off the landscape. Southeastern part of the United States by far has more trees than the western part of the United States. Well, I should say the Pacific um, coast. And they harvest more trees. Okay? And that might come to a surprise, come, come as a surprise to some of you. Because to tell you the truth, there's a little bit of a band um, in here where the Appalachian Trail is and the Appalachians are, um, that has native trees. That has some old growth. And there might be a few pockets up in Maine that have some old growth and some around the Great Lakes that might still exist. But if you look at basically split the United States in half, you look at the eastern part of the United States, um, you know, it was all devoid of trees. In the early 1800s, 1800s, the mid 1800s, um, pretty much we wiped out all the trees. And what wasn't taken then was definitely taken in the mid 1900s. Uh, so 1950, 1940 was definitely taken out by then. So really all this forest that you see, all this harvest. Okay, So this is timber removals, cubic feet per square mile. All right, so if it's Blue, it's greater than 400. Purple, 200 to 400 cubic feet per square mile. So you can see that Alabama, Georgia, all this region in here, heavy, heavy timber removal. That's all replanted trees. That's all just second growth trees. So you cut the primary growth and you planted a bunch of seedlings and they grew up and now you're cutting them you cut those you plant more and basically this entire region here is secondary growth um and they're basically tree farms where you're cutting the trees for for that purpose some of the swamps okay so i don't want to say all of it but some of the swamps and things like that some of the wet areas where cypress trees and things like that are being cut Okay, that's some old growth material, the old growth trees there. Um, those are primary growth cuts that's going on. 
but nothing compared to the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Now, old growth aren't cut all that often unless a private owner owns the land or you're going in and you're just cutting single trees, so you're not clear cutting. But Pacific Northwest, uh, a lot of that is secondary growth that's being cut, but right next to it is primary growth. Uh, so um, we learn from our mistakes on the eastern part of the United States by cutting everything down. And we try not to make the same mistakes on the western part of the United States. Um, so you'll see a lot more old growth forests. You, you'll see a lot more primary growth, um, original growth that occurs on the western part of the United States. So that might really come to uh, as a surprise to some of you that, you know, the majority of the products, lumber, paper, those kind of things, they're really coming out of southeastern United States. Okay. So we can look at this. We can pull the numbers. We can look at, you know, the amount of natural forests. We can look at the amount of public land. Forest industry, so these are forest companies, how much uh, um, land they own, and you know how much is private or farmed land. And you can just start pulling every state. You can look at a different regions, okay? So the Northeast region, we'll come back and we'll talk about the trees and the habitat and things like that that occur in the Northeast region and all these regions for that matter. Okay, but you can see. The dominant ones, Maine, that shouldn't be a surprise. Most people um, associate Maine with force. Okay? Some of the other ones, New York, Pennsylvania, uh, that's also probably not a huge surprise. Um, if you've ever been to the eastern part of the United States, you would know that that's where you really want to go if you want to see trees. Maine, okay, and New York, Pennsylvania, maybe West Virginia. Um, and that's where you're going to see trees. The rest is pretty devoid of trees. And one of the key components that you should draw from this is look at how much national forest these places have. So public land, national forest, hardly any. I mean, most of these states have none. Okay. Public land, some have, you know, state parks and things like that um, that are still there. Um, or have been established since the clear cutting, things like that. But most of the land in these regions is dominated by private ownership. Okay? And like I said before, on public land that's managed by the Forest Service, clear cutting is rarely, uh, rarely okayed or rarely a method that's used. Okay? On private land, other in other words, though, private land, you can really do whatever you like. It's your land. You can clear cut it um, and replant it if you like. Uh, and so a lot of the clear cutting that you would see, you know, might come off of some of these private areas. Okay, let's look at a little bit um, of another region. So north central, this is around the Great Lakes. I, uh, I think not a big surprise to most of you if you've been to those regions or you think about those regions. Michigan is, you know, heavily forested. Minnesota heavily for forested. Missouri's got some good forests in Wisconsin. The rest of them are, are lacking in forest. But um, again, same kind of trend in the central United States. Not a lot of nat national forest. Okay? and a huge amount of privately owned forest. Okay? A little more public and a little more national forest than you see in the um, northeastern region. But again, still obviously dominated, 52,380 out of the 780,000 miles that um, is included there. Okay. Let's jump over to some of the Great Plains. Not a big surprise. They're called the Great Plains. They're the Plain States. These are the grassland areas. You hardly find any trees. Um, and the trees that you do find, privately owned. So the forests are pretty much privately owned. 
a few. Okay, South Dakota is dominated because of the Black Hills. That's kind of the dominant tree area for South Dakota. But the rest of them really don't have any national forests, hardly any public land, very little forest industry, and a ton of privately owned um, land. And some of it has trees on it. Okay. Southeast, where I said before, this is really dominant, um, starting to become like a dominant region uh, for forest management or the forest industry, mainly with states like Georgia and North Carolina. Okay? They have a large amount of forest material there, um, most of it, again, in private ownership okay? or designated as farmland. Okay. Still, very little national forest. Okay. Four thousand out of the out of the fifty nine thousand. Same story in what we call the South Central. A few dominants: Alabama, okay, Kentucky, Mississippi. Okay, um, but again, national forest land, very little. Okay, um, private ownership, very high. And you might think, well, okay, why do we have Forest Service even in the eastern part of the United States? Why is the Forest Service, you know, why is their main office in the eastern part of the United States? Well, because that's where it's been. Um, that's changing, I believe, uh, that the Forest Service is actually going to have its main office in Colorado now. Um, at least BLM is going to have their main office in Colorado, but I believe Forest Service um, will probably fall suit if not, if they haven't already. Um, and that's mainly because, look, you know, all this private ownership, Forest Service has no regulations, no comments, anything like that on this private owned land. They talk about the the national forest land, sure, absolutely. They can talk about the water running off, sure. The fires that are coming off, absolutely. But not the cutting method or anything like that on these private owned lands. Pacific Northwest. So again, like I said before, um, you got to look at the system. We we associate the you know Oregon and Washington and even Alaska with a massive amount of forested material and indeed there's a lot of forested material however um and you know a lot of the national forests occur in oregon washington alaska so you might you see that national forests are now higher in the amount of area than privately owned forest okay. you also see that in california um, Hawaii, there's just not much from a forest standpoint, not much cutting of forest. And to tell you the truth, you know, sometimes things like banana farms and, and coconut farms and things like that, they don't actually get registered as being forested land. Um, they get registered as being cropland. And so they don't get this denotion as, as part of that. Okay. And then um, the region that you and I live in, you can see that not a huge amount of forested habitat, um, not a huge amount of uh, material being removed from this region, but again, dominated. This region is dominated by national forests. Uh, very little private land, a lot of national land. So this is why it's important for us to look at the eastern part of the United States and how they manage for us and the western part of the United States and how they manage for us and kind of compare the two because it's very different and it's very different for, a, you know, a very good reason. The eastern part of the United States is dominant, uh, dominated by private owners. The Western United States is dominant by government owned land. Okay? And, you know, with, you know, other public and forest industries and things like that split in between. Okay. So 
what does this look like? What does this look like from a standpoint of where are we going in the future? Okay, so this is a map of the United States and it's color coded and what these percents over here are. So you can hardly see the very, the really light green is zero to 1%. And so that would be Texas, Oklahoma, um, those states are kind of that really light green and then some of the north um, central and northeastern states. That light green means that you're we're expecting zero to one percent growth in the forest industry okay in the next five years. So you know one of the kickers here is Maine. Zero to one percent growth. Not cutting any more in Maine. Well, what else do we look at? We'll just go down and we start looking at these numbers and you can see that majority of the eastern United States, the max that they're getting at is about 5% growth okay, with you know maybe one okay, outside of that 5% growth. Jump over to the western United States. Okay. What's the problem here or what's the issue here? The western United States is going to explode in the amount of material that's cut off the landscape in the western United States. Okay? With you know Idaho going from in the next five years going to increase by 30 or 40 percent. Okay? Same same thing with Colorado, 20, 30 percent, Washington, Oregon, 20, 30 percent. So huge amount of growth in the forest industry is expected in the western United States. Some of this growth clearly has to be on forest service land. I mean you looked at the private land that's available in those regions and there's hardly any private land. Okay? So that growth has to come from the forest service um, and that's what we're expecting in the next you know five to ten years is that growth in the forest industry is going to come here. It's not that's not a big surprise that there's no growth over here because this is private ownership. Okay? Private owners, if you're a good private owner and you're running a tree industry and you've been running it for a long time, you know exactly how many trees you can take. You know exactly how much material you can take off your landscape. And you shouldn't be growing too much because you're limited by how much land you have okay they're not making any new land and so you really don't have that option to expand now on the western part of the united states it's quite possible the government is selling some of the government land to private ownership we'll talk about that when that occurs but this there's nothing to sell okay? now maybe you take over a you know, cotton farm, or you might take over um, a sunflower farm or rice farm or something like that and plant trees on it. Okay, so you might get some growth that way. In some of these states that are next to, um, you know, the swamp region, you might be taking out some of the old swamp trees and things like that. So you might get some growth that way. But for the most part, most of your growth is not really coming because you don't have that opportunity. You're you're stagnant, you're stale, and so um, you, you take what you can, okay? All right, so next time we're gonna talk about what happens after a fire breaks out, burns the landscape. We're gonna talk about a topic called succession, and it doesn't have to be fire, it could be a clear cut, um, it could be a fire, it could be some other natural disturbance, a volcano, whatever it is, a mud flat or, uh, you know, a flood that comes through and wipes out all forest material and changes the landscape. Succession comes in. We're going to talk about the signs of succession and then how it might differ in those different regions. If you have a fire that breaks out in the Pacific Northwest, how's that going to differ than a fire that breaks out in the Northeast region? And what's succession going to look like? Um, is it going to be a different timetable? Are you expecting, you know, pioneer plants to come in within the first year, two years, five years? 
Okay? And when is that going to switch over? Okay? So next time, that's what we're going to check out. And we're going to check out that out based on the different regions.